Hello and welcome to the local campaign. I'm Gord Martineau from City News. On October 19th, Canada will elect the 42nd Parliament of this country and Rogers TV is the only station producing debates of all of Toronto's 25 ridings. For the next hour, you're going to hear from the candidates from Etobicoke North. But before we introduce the candidates, let's take a closer look at the riding, Etobicoke North. The riding of Etobicoke North is bordered by the city of Mississauga on the west and York Region to the north. The southern border runs along parts of Eglinton Avenue West and Dixon Road. On the eastern edge is Weston Road and a portion of the Humber River. Neighborhoods in this riding include Rexdale, John Garland, Thistletown and the Albion Islington BIA. Recognizable landmarks are the Hindu Mandir north of Finch Avenue, west of Highway 427, Woodbine Entertainment Center on Rexdale Boulevard, the Humber College campus off Highway 27, and the Rexdale Community Hub near Finch and Kipling Avenues. The incumbent MP is Liberal Party member Christy Duncan. And now we're going to give each candidate one minute to make their opening statement. This will be done in the order of most seats by party in the House of Commons. So we will logically begin with Toyin Dada. Toyin? Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Toyin Dada and I am the conservative candidate for our riding at Tobacco North. I am a resident of our riding. I've lived there for the last 15 years and currently do with my husband. I've done a lot of service with many organizations within our riding, such as Albion, Boys and Girls Clubs, Micro Skills, West Indian Volunteer Community Social Services, and many more. Um, one thing I would like to remind our voters in Etobicoke North is that this election is about our economy. This election is about having a leader who is going to be able to handle and strengthen our economy in the midst of a global fragile economy and the leader that is able to do that is Stephen Harper and the Conservative Party and so I look forward to having your support in this election. Thank you. Next, Faisal Hassan, the NDP. My name is Faisal Hassan and I'm your NDP candidate for Etobicoke North. I'm running to be your next member of Parliament. I'm your, I'm your neighbour and I live in Etobicoke North. Over the past 10 years, I've I have seen families in our community working harder and harder and falling further behind. I, I know that, it, I know that um, it doesn't have to be that way. That's why I'm running in this election. I, I, over the, um, of, um, on over the doors, you have told me that the important issues in this election is about jobs and the economy. It's about health care. It's about child care. It's about Bill C-51 and Bill C-24, transit and infrastructure. In this election, it's a very important that we have a government that listens to you, that cares about your community, and that fights for you and an effective representative for Etobicoke North. Thank you very much. Next candidate, Kirsty Duncan of the Liberal Party. I'm Kirsty Duncan, and I'm proud to have served Etobicoke North for the past seven years. During that time, I have championed Etobicoke North and our families. I've brought real funding to Etobicoke North. $1.5 million for an athletic facility, $500,000 for a jobs program, and during the first two weeks of this campaign alone, $300,000 for our community. I have attended over 1,700 events to listen to you and learn from you. And each day in our constituency office, we help between 50 and 100 people, reuniting our families and ensuring our seniors have a secure retirement. This work is vitally important to Etobicoke North and I love the work I do. On October 19th, I ask that you give me the opportunity to continue this work to re-elect me so we can build, continue our work, a better Etobicoke North. Next, representing the Green Party, Akhtar Ayub. Good morning. Uh, my name is Akhtar Ayub. By profession, I'm a mechanical engineer. By occupation, I'm a service consultant. Um, the candidate for the Green Party of Canada from Etobicoke North. Green Party of Canada, uh, fiscally, we are very conservative. Every penny we're going to spend, we're going to think 10 times to make sure we squeeze that penny and get 
the most benefit for the citizen of this country. Socially, we are very liberal. We're not going to divide our citizen in class in different classes. We will try to make bridges with those people. And third, environmentally, we are very friendly and we are very conservative on the environment. Green Party of Canada is not only a one issue party. Our platform is about our Canada, its platform is about our democracy, our platform is about our leadership in the world community, and our platform is about the citizen of this country. Thank you. Next candidate running is an independent, George Zebick. George? Yeah, may I correct that? Independent liberal. Independent liberal, fine. Uh, my name is George, George Zebick. Uh, I'm not a member, presently a member of the Federal Liberal Party, but I'm an independent liberal. I acted as membership secretary in the Federal Liberal Party under Roy McLaren and Roy Cullen until I understand Roy Cullen was asked to resign and replaced by a female candidate who had no nomination fight. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. I still have a few major tax clients. Uh, after studying accounting at McGill University, I did an MBA at the University of Western Ontario. My father died when I was 12 years old. I have four younger sisters. We never had a problem with violence towards women. We all contributed to the survival of our family unit. Uh, my mother, fortunately, was born on a farm in Renfrew County. When she grew up, she went to a small red schoolhouse until grade eight. George, I'm but there have was to hold no you there. Your, to take your one her minute to is up. George, your one minute is up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next candidate is Anna DiCarlo, the Marxist Leninist Party of Canada. Yesterday on October 5th, Prime Minister Stephen Harper announced that an agreement has been reached with the Trans Pacific Partnership trade deal. He did this in opposition to tens of thousands of farmers who were protesting the uh, secret negotiations that were taking place and demanding protection. He did this in opposition to representatives of workers across the country, who are especially in the auto sector, which will have a very big impact on Ontario. They're predicting huge, massive uh, uh, job losses because of this trade deal. This will directly affect Canadian workers and it favours a handful of wealthy owners and directors of monopoly corporations. The fact that he did this during the middle of an election tells us a lot about what is happening to the political process in Canada. The important decisions that are concerning the economy and other issues that are directly affecting the people are being handed over to these global corporate elite. The Marxist-Leninist Party of Canada is fighting to empower Canadians. We think this is the most important question. Thank you. Your time is up. Sorry. Uh, we are now going to begin our question and answer period of this debate. Each candidate will be given 30 seconds to respond, followed by discussion. Uh, there are a number of issues that are of interest nationally, but also we'll talk about uh, issues that are of interest uh, particularly to Etobicoke North, one of them being transit. The TTC, for example, is the least subsidized public transit system in North America. It is woefully underfunded, and successive politicians through the years have negated responsibility by kicking the issue down the road. Let the next guy figure out the transit situation. What will you do to improve transit in Etobicoke North? Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing um, as a government is actually investing into transit. Uh, as a federal government, we've invested, we've actually partnered with John Tory and his Smart Track program, which plans on bringing uh, subway extensions right into Etobicoke North, into Etobicoke. And we know that that is something that is very, very important for the workers in our community. And we are glad to do this without raising taxes and while keeping our budget balanced. Because at the end of the day, if you raise taxes and people lose their jobs, there are no commuters needing to get to their jobs in the first Basil, place. Basil, you're next. Yes, um, I have, you have told me that transit, as you know, is an important issue in Etobicoke North. We, the NDP, are prepared to be a stable partner for the City of Toronto. We are allocating $1.3 billion a year to help the City of Toronto because the transit is very important in our city. Thank you. Kirsty. 
Uh, the Liberal Party will make the largest infrastructure investment in Canadian history. $125 billion. There will be $20 billion for transit over 10 years. We in Etobicoke North know how important transit is in order to go to get the job interview, to get to the job, and to get home early to be with our families. I'm really proud of the investment the Liberals are making. Again, it is the largest infrastructure investment in Canadian history. Next. Thank you. If you see in a history and if you see our constitution, there's no mentioning about the municipality uh, mentioned in our constitution. We, for Canada, what we need, we need a council of Canadian governments. So make sure we make a bridges uh, where prime minister will be there, all the premiers of the provinces and the representative from the municipalities, they will be there. To make sure anything we get from the federal government is equally distributed among all of us. So in this way, we don't have a fighting. Right now, Green Party of Canada wants 1% of GST from the federal government directly from the federal to the municipality. Actar, your time is up. Thank George, 30 seconds. What's the issue again? Public transit. What will you do to improve public transit in Etobicoke North? <clears throat> what I will do is, uh, I see a, uh, finance being a very important area, and uh, I understand from the current budget that $20 billion is being spent on military expenditures and $17 billion equalization payments to the province. That's $14 billion. I can do better than the Liberal Party. I would put in $5 billion each year as long as it's necessary. All right, thank you. Anna DiCarlo. So first of all, I find it always amazing that like over the past uh, 10 years, we've seen the deterioration of transit. And prior to that, under the Liberals, we saw deterioration. There's a, the austerity agenda, which attacks all the public services that we need, including transportation. And now that there's an election on, we're told that there's a plan to do it. So I think the issue is that Canadians should make sure they defeat the Conservatives, they shouldn't let the Liberals get in, and they should fight that the infrastructure that they need is not based on some empty promises that are going to serve whoever the uh, uh, decision makers decide to serve, but that we have to have a right. new political Thank process. You. One other item I'd like to bring up for discussion, and that is youth unemployment. In 1980, 26% of young people in this country while working were still living with mom and dad because they couldn't afford to make it on their own even while they were working. That number is now over 40%. So that's a pretty dismal number when you look at the overall employment picture. And young people in this country are tremendously discouraged and very daunted by the fact the only jobs available to them, for the most part, are jobs that are part-time or contract jobs where there are no benefits. So they can't plan on making a career out of a specific job. So how will they uh, afford to buy a house, get married, have children, et cetera? What will you do to improve youth unemployment? Well, I thank you very much for raising this because this is an issue of particular importance to our voters in Etobicoke North. When it comes to youth unemployment, what we need are jobs. What we need is a strong economy that is supporting businesses, that is allowing us to have a forum for jobs to be created that youth can be employed in. The last thing we need right now is to raise taxes um, and to to kill our businesses and think that somehow that's going to help youth unemployment. Under the Ontario Liberals, youth unemployment in Ontario specifically is now the highest in the country. We cannot afford two Liberal governments. Okay, next. Yes, uh, yes. in Utopical North, the youth unemployment is the highest uh, unemployment among the uh, city of Toronto. We, the NDP, are committed to providing employment for the youth, and the ways we're going to do it is to create a partnerships with municipalities, provincial, and other private entities to make sure that the youth are trained a partnerships. And also, those are returning to schools, that they have summer jobs, and also that they have internships that are paid, so that every single organization that is based in the Tropical North will reserve some jobs for the youth through partnerships and through resources that we're going Here's to create. Young. 
Uh, the Liberals will invest $1.3 billion to create 40,000 youth jobs over three years. That is 13 times more than the NDP is investing. There will also be 40 million invested each year in science, technology, engineering, math, business, co-ops, and a new $25 million invested for a youth service program. This will help our community. What I see every day in our constituency office is youth who need jobs. I rewrite their resumes late into the night. We get them into jobs okay, programs. Uh, thank you. The youth employment. See, the topic here is that we have this issue. So that's a concern we have. Now, Christy Duncan and the other people, they were telling us the solution. But what's the actual cause that we have? That we need to find the cause of this problem instead of dumping money in this and that. The cause is that how many people we have, they're getting a technical education. Go to Japan, go to Japan, they're all technical. They are selling all their technicality on us. They are making as a salespeople. The world is making as a salespeople in this Canada. That's what we're getting all behind right. with everybody. George? Thank you. On youth unemployment, I don't think our three major parties, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, and the NDP Party, have been innovative enough. There should be no people, no family, that holds two federal government jobs. One of them should be taken away and made available for experience purposes where uh, young people get part-time experience to give them experience to apply for full-time jobs. I have seen no successful program from the three major parties being the Conservatives Liberals and NDP. I'm going to hold you on there, George. On, Anna DiCarlo, you're next. George, entrepreneurship. George, time's up. Anna? So I don't think that we can have this problem solved until we take a serious new direction with our economy. That right now, all our manufacturing is being destroyed. Our manufacturing is down to a, a paltry 20%. Yes. We're shipping our resources out of the country. So unless a really serious change in the direction of our economy, where we build a new economy. We have so many things that we need in the country, and this is what has to be done, in my opinion. The, the, these, these empty promises of infrastructure and just vague things that we don't even know what we're talking about. All right, uh, your time's up. Now, the floor is open if anybody wants to jump in. I mean, everyone's got some ideas on this. Go ahead. Uh, Go thanks. Ahead. First of all, I would like to point out that uh, the Liberals will double the Conservative investment in infrastructure wow. and public transit. And on the NDP, I really want to point out we will put in 13 times more for youth jobs. Go I, ahead. Yes, yeah. I mean, Kirsty um, uh, Duncan, you have been the seven years representing this community, and we have the highest youth unemployment. You have not delivered, and we, the NDP, are going to provide 41 thousand youth employment. We're also going to focus manufacturing. All the jobs in Etobicoke North have, have left under the watch of Christy Duncan and presenting liberal representations. George, you, you got some ideas change? here? Well, you know, doubling, uh, for example, the provincial liberal party, they budgeted $15 billion a year for entrepreneurship. Far too high. I would like to say on uh, infrastructure as well as on the youth unemployment that we are currently addressing youth unemployment. You have these great promises that you're making, but the truth of the matter is the money is going to come from somewhere, and it's going to come from the, the taxing the very people that we're trying to get into work. Secondly, on infrastructure spending, our government is already investing. $53 billion through the Build Canada plan in the infrastructure in the nation, as well as partnering and giving $2.6 billion directly into the GTA through the Smart Track program. Doctor? Well, as I said before, we need to look on the core issue, which is the cause. What is causing that unemployment? The unemployment is because we are not spending money on our technical education. Listen, guys, I work for Honda. Honda, the, the manufacturer is in, 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 in Japan. Here they just send us a product so we can just assemble it. 
or colleges, universities just coming with the, with the degrees. Those degrees are very easy to replace. But if you have a mechanics, you have a carpenters, you have a technicians, you have a doctors, you have a engineers, you can replace those people. And Go they ahead, are the Jeff actual Faisal. people but who yeah, produce um, this money. We had a conservative and liberal government, and the reason Utopico North has been ignored is because we don't have an effective representatives. We, all the jobs have left, all the manufacturing jobs have left, the youth are, employment is the highest. In, 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 in the Ontario. city of Toronto, or in city in, of Toronto, what we what we need to do is government that listens to you, and the NDP government is going to bring back manufacturing jobs back. We are going to I invest innovation By tax credit. No, we are going to raise taxes. We're going to invest innovation tax credit to bring I've manufacturing been voted jobs back. the hardest working member of parliament in all of Canada. I'd like to tell you what I do for youth jobs. I rewrite resumes late into the night. I get people into job programs. We run a clothing bank from the downstairs. We follow up to make sure people are getting those jobs. We have people intern in our office who've well, gone on to jobs. get well, good jobs. jobs. Exactly. You All can ask left. the conservatives yeah, who no, have failed miserably, have, have failed miserably. Uh, Hardest working you MP. Like okay, I'll yeah. hold you there. You oh, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to change gears a little bit, but it still has to do with jobs. Okay. And it also has to do with immigration and the refugee mm -hmm. crisis in yes. Syria. Yes. Okay. We are being asked to open the doors and take in tens of thousands of refugees from Syria. We're also uh, vastly aware of the fact that to become a Canadian citizen, to pass all the immigration standards is becoming more and more difficult. At the same time, you've got a situation here in Canada where unemployment is high, especially among youth. And so how do we balance taking in refugees and immigrants from other countries and providing jobs for those people once they get here? I really appreciate the question that you've asked. Um, the matter here is balance. The matter here is making sure that we offer um, the opportunity for refugees to come into our nation while making sure that we preserve the opportunities that are here for Canadians on ground. Our current government has actually uh, increased the number of immigrants that have become Canadian citizens uh, on average over the last nine years compared to the previous nine years of the Liberal government. And we've done a lot of work in, we already committed even to bringing in a specific number of refugees that we know will be manageable, 20,000 refugees that will okay. be manageable Faisal. for our economy. Yes. The, the situation where we are at the moment is because we don't have a leadership. We had conservatives and the liberals at the same time. This election we have an alternative. With regard to refugees in Syria, these refugees mainly, we have United Nations Convention Protocol 1967 and refugee mandate relating to. These are women and children who are fleeing from war and we have responsibility to help women and children but at the same time, we have to invest in a tropical north. And the way to do that is actually have a leadership that cares and that listens to you. Kirsty. Thank you. I think my two colleagues here forget that Etobicoke North is the fifth most diverse riding in the country proudly. And proudly. And we will first of all uh, increase the number of grandparents we bring in from the paltry 5,000 applications each year with the Conservatives to 10,000. We power, will though. increase the number, the age for bringing your children from 19 to 22, that's restoring it. And when you're bringing a spouse from overseas, they will become a permanent resident. There will no longer be the two-year wait period. When it comes to Syria, I have fought tirelessly for the people of Syria for the past three years. This conservative government want to bring in a paltry number of 1,300. Thank you. Well, we will come to the same thing, the same, because every issue we have, we are discussing. Please keep in mind those three things, the issue, the cause, and the solution. So now all of them, they're telling me about the solution, but tell me about the cause, that what happened to those people, why they are jumping in the oceans why they are leaving their homes and they they're not doing anything and they, they wanted to come to canada they wanted to come to what happened what happened to them why what happened to their homes who blow their homes what happened there we ISIS. need to find That's we need we That's need to really find the, the the real issue okay the real issue that we right now canada living united nation the peacekeeping where we were okay. famous in 1957 Actor, as a world you. leader george 
I think one of the problems here is that the federal government under Mr. Harper and the provincial government under Premier Wynne and Premier McGinty, they haven't been looking at the supply-demand situation. Uh, we have to have the jobs to take in these people. When we have massive unemployment among our youth, it raises a question. So I think it's important to look at the issue. We have a problem in Ontario. We have 600,000 people on social assistance or welfare. What is the cause? Anna Poor DiCarlo, management you're next. by the federal and provincial governments. Listen, I think everybody knows in their hearts that Canada has the wealth at its disposal to be able to build a new economy. There's no issue. We're, we're not some impoverished country sitting somewhere. I think that the point that was raised here about what is the cause of the Syrian refugees is very important, that Canada's participating right, in yes. a U.S. military aggression yes. against Syria. Right. Against the there causes. are terrorist yes. groups yes. in Syria being funded yes. by the U.S., yes. and this has to stop. We we're have to stop US. interfering, yes. but we're participating in it. We have so far already participated in five in bombings ISIS. of Syria. We, we should in fighting yes. ISIS. You yes. talk about yes. the You're fighting of ISIS, the problem. But let, let me this tell you here's one thing. The thing. We have done three things. We have helped with the refugee crisis by welcoming refugees. We have people. also offered much humanitarian aid to the area, as well as addressing the cause of the matter, which is ISIS. And the truth oh. is this. If we do not address ISIS, they will continue to kill thousands and thousands of people and okay. displace mm -hmm. many Let's more refugees. Who created ISIS? Do you know who created ISIS? Do you? Who created ISIS? Where the ISIS came from? If you have a history knowledge, then you will go back and see exactly what's happening in that part of the region. But we started from Iraq. Now. We started from Iraq. We've been to, we've been to uh, United Nations. This is responsibility to protect. Okay, we took that one. We took as a military action there. We went to Libya to help those people to protect them. But after protecting those people, what we did? What we did? We start thinking changing the regime. There you create something else. Now you, you have the Assad Bashir there. You have a problem there. Because on one side, you're trying to help the protector, but on the other thing, he is thinking that, you know what, if they came to this country right now, they're going to change my regime. That's why Russia is jumping Bye at well. that position. The, the, the mess we are in yeah. is created by the liberals and the conservatives here. And I think um, the uh, Syria crisis, we we're talking about jobs and Syria crisis, with immigration, family unification, is a huge backlog created by the conservatives and the liberals. What we need to do is to hire more public service to deal with those backlogs and also to, to, to no, it is no, it is it's fact. It's a backlog. Is if create, it's a backlog, we if we are going, if we are going to create uh, family unifications, you, you need to, to you, you, you need to hire more people to deal with the immigration matter. Also, what you need to do is to create jobs in the tropical north. And the ways to do that is actually create youth j employment and also How? investing you have innovation tax credit. You didn't you give a response. That. I have given to I have the Eastern Manufacturing Innovation Tax Credit will do that. Here, see, what were you saying? Uh, I think uh, it's really important. This takes us back to Syria. The Conservatives only brought, or they claim to have brought, 1,300 people. Myself and John McCallum fought for years, two years, to increase that number to 10,000. And it's only when an election's coming that actually, well, it's, I'm actually not finished. Yep. When yeah. the Conservatives finally are coming to an election, then they say it's 10,000. Liberals will bring 25,000 Syrian so refugees to Canada. So let me ask a question Canada, generally. Yeah. We're talking about three to four million people from Syria alone who are on the run because they're afraid for their lives. Why is it then that Germany says, we'll take 300,000, and we're looking at 1,500, 10,000? Why can't we do more? Well, well. I'll go down the line, and then we'll open it up, okay? Go ahead. 
The main reason for that is what you said in the beginning, which is balance. It's making sure that we are both being offering that place, safe place for the refugees to come to while making sure that we protect Canada's economy. Because like we've said, the um, unemployment is already high. There are many things that it, we have to do it gradually. We have to do it in a way that we make sure that we are still taking care of the Canadians that are currently living in Canada while offering a helping hand to those who need a place to go. Uh, we, we have to be responsible yeah. in the way that well, we address well, we this. We have an obligation to the United Nations Charter and the convention. And we, the NDP, is committed bringing each year 9,000 refugees from Syria, especially the children and the women who have been are fleeing from wars. And that is very important, 9,000 starting this November and every year thereafter. Kirsty. I think you raise a really good point. Canada has been a beacon around the world. We've brought tens of thousands from Hungary. We brought from Uganda and Vietnam. Under this conservative government, we see cuts to refugee health care, would have been labeled by the Supreme Court of Canada as cruel and unusual. 1,300 is inexcusable when 250,000 have died and there are 12 million internally and externally displaced. We need a more compassionate system, one that's based on um, economic opportunity, but compassion and family reunification. We increase health care transfers. The other day I was, was knocking on the door and I see this lady come out with a son and she can't even speak English. They were from Syria. Then the son came out and he's talk, talking to me. He said, you know what, my mom, she's here. She's saved, she's okay, food, everything. But she's very depressed, very depressed, because she can't speak language. All our family members, most of them, of her age, they're all there, okay? So now when you bring those kind of people, first of all, when they're depressed, they're sick, they go to the hospitals. And we treat them because that's our obligation, because they are here right now. But who, who pay the price? The poor, middle, the taxpayers of this country. So the thing we need to do here is instead of bringing those people, we need to go back and look, open our history book, that what was our position back in 1957, why we got a peace Nobel Prize for this country? Because we were not taking sides, we were peacekeepers, we were, we were developing places. All right, George. Yeah. What's the question? The question is, why shouldn't we be taking more refugees? I asked the question, if Germany can take 300,000, why are we talking about such small numbers as 1,500 or even 10,000? Well, I'd like to know why Germany can take 300,000. Well, that's the question. You know, I why? need that information to find out how they are doing it. Because they have programs in place, I would assume. Yeah. Listen, I think the only reason why we aren't taking more decision makers is because Canadians aren't able to decide. It's left into the hands of a tiny exactly. government that yes. does whatever it wants. That's the reason. Because the, immediately after this refugee crisis came to light, Canadians across the country showed that because we're facing such a serious humanitarian crisis in the world, it's our duty to help. And we should do everything we can. And the only obstruction is it to it is what we're seeing. That is a government this, that's more concerned to promote Islamophobia. Is this because Islamophobia. of fear mongering? Are we worried that there's going to be some sort of terrorist in the, in the line of refugees trying to come to this country? But the only you, person who you, has for said example, that is the conservative party. You, for example, would be a prime case. Mm -hmm. For example, what the, what the conservative government is trying to do. In other words, if you came to this country you were a naturalized Canadian, yet you involved yourself in some sort of terrorist activity, that citizenship could be revoked and you would be deported back from whence you came. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the right thing to do? Well, I thank you very much for bringing that up because I'd like to clarify to voters in Etobicoke North and let you know that Bill C-24, just like you've mentioned... And, but I, and I mentioned that you're a prime candidate because I know you're because here from I'm, Nigeria. Exactly. I'm a, okay. Niger a Canadian Nigerian right. and I have a dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to clarify to those people who have heard that, you know, your whole family can be deported or you can be deported for a small, you know, stealing candy or even committing murder. This law is only going to affect people who commit terrorism, 
treason or waging war against Canada. I do not plan on committing any of those three crimes, and therefore, I am the least of my concerns is having my citizenship revoked. And the same goes for those of you who are watching. Most of you are mostly concerned about taking care of your families, working hard. The last thing on your mind or your agenda is treason, terrorism, or waging war against Canada. I beg to differ I think the, um, on that. Hold on, I'm going to go down. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the, the Conservative, and also some extent the, the Liberals, which, who voted uh, Bill C-51, is that once you become Canadian citizen, you are Canadian citizen. Full stop, period. Um, now, if you commit a crime, whatever that crime might be, then you'll be brought court of law, and you have your chance to defend yourself, then if you're convicted of a crime, then you save your time. When you save your time, then there is a component called rehabilitation process. Therefore, this is wrong. It's against our constitution. It's against our rights. We, will, we are going to repeal it, Bill C-24 and Bill C-51, because it is unconstitution, it is wrong, Christy. and we will not accept it. It's not Thank just you. any crime, treason, Hold on. terrorism, so on. Thank you. The Liberal Party will repeal Bill C-24. This is what we are talking about. The Liberal Party believes a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. That there are not two classes of Canadians. I don't and think this diminishes, class. this bill diminishes, this bill <laughs> diminishes all our citizenship. And if you break a law, we have something for that. It's called jail. Yes. And I agree, but what, there's a difference between a crime that is committed and committing an act against Canada. Yeah, In is, that right. place, when everyone takes a citizenship oath, Actar, go you ahead. make an oath well, to once you are Canada. Canada. Hold on, Are we talking about the Bill C-51 or Bill C-24? C-24. Bill C-24. Okay. Canada is an immigrant country. Why we need immigrants in this country? Why? Why we bring thousands and thousands people every year? Because we need economics, we need their money, and we need their expertise. When they come to this country and you, they come in, they spend their money, they got, the money is gone. Now we need to treat those people because they are fair car, they are with the, with the, uh, they are the landed immigrant now, but they are the citizen of tomorrow. So we don't need a splitting that this is the first class and a second class citizen. We are all citizens of this country, we need to work as a group, as a nation, so we can show to the world that we can hold that diversity in this country, George. not to split each other. George, you're next. George, you with us? George, what's, what's the issue? Uh, the issue is, if a person comes to Canada as an immigrant, becomes a naturalized Canadian, gets their Canadian citizenship, and then involves themselves in some sort of serious terrorist activity, their Canadian citizenship can be revoked and they should be deported. Do you agree or disagree? I uh, feel that they should be tried in court. Yes. And? And if they're found guilty? And if they're uh, found guilty, they uh, pay the price. Which is? They go to prison. What about their citizenship? Should it be revoked? No. Okay. Anna? I don't think we should have the standard of uh, citizenship re revocation. People should do their time. But I want to raise a question about, uh, you know, I'm never going to commit terrorism, so unless you're planning to commit terrorism, don't worry about it. Because with Bill C-51, the new anti-terrorist legislation, some young person who goes and protests a mining development that they think is going to destroy the environment, they can be charged with the promotion of terrorism or inciting terrorism or promoting it. The definition has become so broad, so vague, that people are very concerned but that what, what kind of thing can I be captured by? And we know, for example, the Aboriginal people, thank God, at least the Indigenous people can't be uh, deported because they're from here. But lots of, like Canada, by definition, is comprised of people who have dual okay. citizenship. Jump in. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, go ahead, uh, somebody. Uh, okay, I'll go on. And, and I think uh, what we are discussing here is about our rights and freedoms and liberties. And as you know here, my right to the uh, uh, Conservatives and my left to the Liberals here, they vote together most important issues that affect our community. 
especially tropical north and this great country of ours. We need to repeal Bill 51 because four prime ministers said it's unconstitution. The United Nations has spoken about it. With regard to Bill C-24, as you know, we have said that Canadian, once you are Canadian, you are Canadian. Therefore, this is creating a kind of fear-mongering and creating a two-tier of citizenship. I we like must stop it and repeal it. The fear is it's actually true. taking place by the people who are lying to members of our community and telling them that you can be deported for doing any crime. The, the, the you mentioned Bill C-51, and I would like to say, actually, you said that on a debate in the radio. You said that any minister can take away anybody's citizenship arbitrarily. Uh, what were you saying? Hold on. Yes. Go ahead. I would like to address uh, Bill C-51 since, since yes. my NDP yeah. colleague keeps bringing it up. First for? of all, Liberals have been clear. If Mr. Trudeau is elected, he will do three things. He will clarify and focus what he considers overly broad measures. Secondly, he will ensure parliamentary oversight, like our it Five Eyes partners. Yeah. And yeah. thirdly, there will be a mandatory review after three years. The, the, also, we had four prime ministers, former prime ministers, come forward and say the measures were important, but we have concerns. We're telling you what we you will change. For. The you NDP yeah, has for. not told us what we parts they're bringing it. back. You yes, voted. but yeah. your you leader, let me finish. Respect, your leader, let me finish my sentence. Okay, go ahead. Your leader has said he will bring back parts. He's just not no, telling no, us what no, no, no. parts. My and leader, I would like to finish. I would like to say, go ahead. Elizabeth May, the Green Party leader, she was the first member of the parliament. She says no to this bill. Why? No, the NDP, they, they no, took some time. Oh, uh, yes, but it took some time. But Krista Duncan, she voted. I'm coming on that one. She yes. voted for she that. But let's. So she says what no. What parts are you bringing back? We're not going to bring anything. We're because four prime ministers, hold on, four ex-prime minister of Canada, they criticized the bill. Six Supreme Court justices, they criticized the bill. Hundred legal advisors, more than hundred, they says no. We don't need to rush for this bill. We need accountability. We need consultation with the Canadians. If the Canadians are okay, then yes, we will do something. But right now, Stephen Harper, he said, you know what? There was one crazy Muslim. He went to Ottawa. He did a shooting. After that, he came. He says, I'm here to save Canadians. I'm here to save. Excuse me, what we need? What we need for that one? We need bridges with the communities. Every community in this country, we need to make a bridges with those people. Well, we um, need to invest. For, right, let me, we, we, we need to invest in the mental health system, mental health system. But the thing is, there is no leader in our country. There is no leader. They're all politicians because they're looking for their offices. They want to have an office. Uh, 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 we cannot afford another four more years of liberal and conservative coalition. As you know, our rights is important. Our liberty and freedoms is very important. Christy Duncan says she hasn't voted for. She voted for she voted the for entire it. Liberal yes, Party. She voted for it. It doesn't have her oversight. She voted yeah. for what we're going to do. The only party, actually, some extent of the Green Party, have also voted for uh, um, um, uh, repealing. We are going to repeal it, and we opposed it in the first place. And therefore, we need real change, a change that you can trust, a change that will say exactly what we intend to do. We stood up to Stephen okay. Harper. I'm going the, to change the, the discussion now to the, the money, much. the deficit. Okay. Uh, the belief is that among the NDP and the Conservatives that we don't need a deficit. They're, they're very much against it. The Liberals have said under Justin Trudeau that we need a deficit, we need uh, to uh, go the route of deficit financing in order to finance the infrastructure programs that the country needs. So what is the, the benefit to having no deficit as opposed to having a deficit and getting your infrastructure done? Well, the first thing that we have to consider when we talk about the economy of Canada is the fact that this economy plan and this economic plan is something that will not only affect us but will affect generations to come. 
um, our government has had low taxes and we have been able to balance the budget while investing $53 billion nationally into infrastructure. You can come in and say, you know, let's take this huge deficit, but what you're doing is you're mortgaging the futures of our children. We've had a long-term deficit that it took us just now to come out of. We've had two okay. consecutive balanced Russell. budgets. Thank you very much. We have to be responsible. We have to spend what we have. And therefore, a government is about priorities. We're going to make sure that we are going to be responsible and we are going to uh, pay our programs and services so that we don't pass next generations a, a debt. Thank you. Kirsty? Uh, this conservative government has run eight deficits. They've taken us into a second recession. They have the worst GDP growth going back to R.B. Bennett in the 1930s. The Liberals have a real plan, and it's a plan to help the middle class and those struggling to join it, not the ultra-rich like the Conservatives. That's we are going to have a large monthly tax-free benefit that will help nine out of ten Canadians, unlike the Conservatives, plan that will help 15 percent and the NDP has signed on to the Conservatives Actor, failed practices. No. Deficit or no deficit? A little bit is okay because what happened we in Canada we have this issue you go to any store here outside you pick up any product and the products say made in China made in India made in Mexico we have nothing here in this country why what's the reason because we don't have a jobs in this country the small businesses, we don't have that one. We need to have a money spent on our own businesses because if you see back in 2005, before the Stephen Harper came into to his power, this country, where there was no deficit, everything was okay. After that, we are getting, because we are lacking the leadership. The leadership, they don't have a vision. They say, like Libra say, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to spend it there. Excuse me, where is the money? Where is the money we have in this country? Uh, uh, George, <coughs> deficit or no deficit? Well, it's not as simple as that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It boils down to uh, what theory of economics you support. Neither Mr. Harper nor Mr. Trudeau, no, I would say Mr. Harper, Mr. Trudeau, and uh, Mr. Mulcair, they all support Keynesian economics and instead, I suggest they consider increasing citizen discretionary income to shorten any recession. They're out of touch with progressive economics. That's all I have to say. Anna. Well, this, I think that the, this deficit, no deficit discussion is really disinforming. Like, I would really th think that Canadians would like to see where is the government spending its money? What are the needs of our economy? What is the starting point? We don't even have that. We aren't allowed. It's, there's no information presented, and then we're supposed to decide deficit or no deficit. We have lots of resources in the country. We have the Bank of Canada if we want to get low interest or no interest money. But let's start with the discussion of what we need. Even this infrastructure discussion is bizarre. We're, we're left at the mercy of finding out what is it going to be. It's online. Yeah. It's Bill not. Canada it's Canada not Canada online. Canada. Yeah. I'm not an uninformed person. I know yeah. what's being and talked in about. Our community, practically, there's on Kipling Road. If you're coming up toward Albion, you will see construction happening, and it says "Build Canada Plan." This isn't yes, just something online. It's something that's practically being helpful to our hard community. Partisans in the country to filling some potholes. You've got to be kidding. No, well, it's not it? just potholes, it's <laughs> building <laughs> infrastructure. $53 billion dollars being invested into infrastructure is a real amount of money. It's a real amount of money. Okay, we're all, we we're all, we're we're all talking cut. over each other one at a time. Okay, go with you first and then you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I would just want to say we've heard about the Conservative Action Plan, $750 million spent on partisan advertising. That's unconscionable. That could have fed hungry children and our riding. And we have a fiscal, strong fiscal plan to take the books back to balance budget it's by balanced. 2019. Yeah, uh, no, eight deficits, eight deficits. Two recessions. You're the it's only G. Balanced. We are the only G7 country in but recession. But you want to take us out of a well, balanced budget and back into a world that is irresponsible. We have, 
we have we have seen the same story telling that the liberals and the conservatives are here yes we have to have priorities our, our priority is to create to raise federal minimum wage to fifteen dollar per hour provide affordable child care that, that should not cost fifteen dollar uh, it's my turn let me speak uh, it's fifteen dollar per hour uh, affordable childcare, investing housing, investing infrastructure, and making sure that we balance our budget. In our uh, balance, we are going to balance the budget, and we're going to also address all those priorities we have in the government. You have all these spending yes. promises yes. and no way to do Canada, it. at this moment, we have a debt of about $660 billion, they say. We pay $92 million per day. $92 million per day. Where that money go, where we pay those, the money goes to different banks, and that banks belong to different countries, Europe, US, Asia, Middle East, all those big people, they have those banks, and they all, they're taking our money every day, $92 million. What happened to the Bank of Canada, which is a Canadian bank, is broke? No, they're not broke. If we go to the Bank of Canada, and ask for a loan on a very low interest and pay those guys. We don't need you guys anymore. And then I save a $92 million per day. So I don't need to be worried about any daycare. I don't need to be worried about any infrastructure because the money is giving out every day from this country. This, this, we need a leadership who stopped well, that money. Here's the uh, thank you. I do want to talk about the Liberal plan in terms for families, because ultimately that's what politics is about, families. Our plan is to provide a 7% tax cut for the middle class, to provide a larger monthly tax-free benefit than the Conservatives, and the NDP is promising, it sounds good, it well, sounds well, good, I'm not finished. $15 an hour minimum wage. We'd all like to see that, but it's for the federal service. Who in the federal service is getting paid $15 it's an hour? It's one percent. It will. I'm not finished. It's one percent of yeah. Canadians. Our correct. plan will help nine out of ten Canadians and lift 350,000 children out of poverty, and I well, will mention we have seen, child. We have seen the uh, Liberal see? Red Book in 1993, the same story, in raising the federal minimum wage in Etobicoke North, it will help workers in the airport. One Directly, uh, the Canadians. people uh, working in the airport will be affected, and, and it is also affected uh, t telecommunications, banks, as well as the airports, right here in person. It is 100,000, 100, Thousand workers. One percent versus nine. Okay, you, uh, you're That's next. That's not the case. Thank you. That's not the case. I would like to say that you mentioned ra raising children out of poverty. Um, one thing that I would like to mention is that UNICEF, they can make whatever. all the promises they want. We've already done it. UNICEF already made an, a statement uh, mentioning that the child poverty rate in Canada decreased during the recession, pulling roughly 180,000 children out of poverty. And UNICEF, this is not a concern leaning you know third party organization UNICEF credited this decrease to our government's action in putting money back in the pockets of Canadians oh. and so I would like to say that our plan is working their plan is great as it sounds they plan on introducing a carbon yeah. tax a carbon tax is something you that will that. make living I'm in Canada more, okay. more okay. expensive Actar, you're for for every Actar. more expensive Hello guys. okay we all know we are talking about, like as I said before, when you go to a store, you see an item from Making and uh, what happened to Making Canada? How are we going to implement what we make in Canada? Well, it's a home, okay. If we make in Canada and we value added to our products, a clean products, not selling tar, which is a poison to the world, okay? And when they burn that tar there, it comes back to us. And what you have a three three things you need. You need food. You have a choice because you go and you you choose from a market. You have a choice for water. You can have a bottle. I see bottle was there outside. I can use it from a tap. But when it's come to air, you have no choice. George. And what's causing the most? Wait, George most is most next. Of that, George, Actar. George is next. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask uh, our incumbent MP a question from her brochure, which I picked up. Uh, Last night in the Make it quick, George. 
Okay, the question is, uh, she said that Topic on North received funding for seniors initiatives. I'd like to know what the initiatives are. My pleasure. I was happy to write a grant proposal for our uh, St. Andrews seniors and was delighted that we received $25,000 for our seniors. All, seniors. all right, we're going to hold you there because it is time now. Hello, time now to move on to the George. 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 It's time to move on to the closing statements. This will be done in reverse order of the opening statements. Therefore, the first to give closing statement is Anna DiCarlo, Marxist-Leninist Party. So we are fighting for the empowerment of Canadians, and we're calling on everybody <clears throat> to join us. We can't carry on with a political process that keeps Canadians out of the decision-making process, reduces the people to voting for a political party that represents the most powerful interests in the world, the monopolies, every four or five years. We need to have control, we need to build a new economy, take it in a new direction. Voting Marxist-Leninist will send a very clear message that we need a new direction and that we want to be All the right, decision makers. time's up. George Zivik, closing statement, please. My name is George. Uh, my name is George Zivik. I'm an independent liberal because I have been a member of the federal liberal party, but I disagreed with the way they uh, nominated someone to replace Roy Cullen. I, want, I support affordable housing because men and women, the 450,000 and plus on welfare, cannot afford $500 a room. They can only afford $400 a room because I know I had a two bedroom apartment and I know okay, I'm George, speaking from experience. Sorry, your time is up. Uh, Thank you for uh, inviting me Actar? to be on this uh, program. So, we need a great leader for this country, okay? You, we don't need a politician because the politician look for their offices for that four or five years. We need a great leader, a leader who care about ladies, who care about women, who care about children, who care about the, the first nation, who care about the, the peacekeeping in the world. We need a, la a leader like that. And the only person right now in the parliament is that's Elizabeth May. If we lost Elizabeth May, believe me, we'll be in more trouble in the coming days. Here's Thank you. Duncan. This election is about the kind of Canada you want. If you vote for me, you're voting for someone who believes Canada is open, confident, and hopeful, that all our citizenship is equal, and that we're stronger as a country when we work together. I'm born and raised and live in Etobicoke, and I've been voted Canada's hardest working member of parliament. And if you re-elect me on October 19th, I will continue to champion Etobicoke North and our wonderful families. Faisal Hassan. Thank you. I'm your neighbor. I live in Etobicoke North. I know what Etobicoke, Etobicoke North needs. It needs jobs. It needs housing. It needs childcare. It needs healthcare. It needs a family reunification. I'm going to ensure that you have an effective representative in Etobicoke North. As you know, over 35 years, we have the same party, and they have done nothing for Etobicoke North. We have the highest unemployment, and on October 19, vote NDP and vote for change October 19. And vote for me, Faisal Hassan. Thank you. Hello, my name is Toyin Dada, and like I mentioned, I'm the conservative candidate for our area. I'm, I've lived in Etobicoke North, and I understand the many challenges that we face. During the 2011 election, our party made 107 promises to voters across Canada. Right now, we have fulfilled 106 out of 107 promises. I'd like to ask those of you uh, who have voted previously if you've ever had a party deliver so much on the promises that have been made. These other parties have made many great promises, but Sorry. will not be able to Time's deliver. Vote Thanks, for me. panel, for joining us today, and thank you for joining us on the local campaign. The airtimes for other debates can be found at rogerstv.com. I'm Gord Markno. Bye for now. <laughs>